Kavanaugh. We're delighted you could join us this evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, my friends. Let me welcome you to my 40th birthday party. I've never been one to set much store by these artificial points of demarcation, but as it is generally assumed to be a kind of halfway point on the barometer of human longevity, I've taken the opportunity to ruminate not only on the significance of life in general, but of my own steadily declining mortality. In that regard, I've come to the conclusion that a man's life is not so much the sum of his material progress, but of other intangible assets, the most invaluable of which is that often forgotten jewel in the crown of mankind, friendship. That I have arrived at this happy position in life is a testament to all of you, and to four people in particular, to my loyal childhood friend, Jack McCarthy, to my dedicated doctor, Herman Vandenberg, and to my brilliant business partner, Frank Hamilton, I say from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And last, but not least, I would like to single out for special gratitude, my dear wife, Adam. <laughs> and on that note, have a hell of a party. Condemned <laughs> men. Mr. Walker would like to see you all in the oak room. I wonder what he wants. Well, with his newfound sense of mortality, perhaps he's going to put us in the will. Well, maybe he'll leave us the twins. You all know each other, gentlemen, and, of course, you all know Adelaide. Well, you're probably wondering why I've asked you up here to talk to me privately, the Machiavellian maneuvers dancing in your imaginations. Hmm? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I did genuinely want to thank you for your presence in my life and to simply ask the four of you, one for each decade of my life, to join me in a toast. Ah. Chateau Mouton Rothschild, 1948. An extraordinary year for wine, as well as for men. I managed with no small amount of difficulty to get my hand on a case bottled within 24 hours of my conception. Please. To my friends. For life. Hmm. Now... I have a little surprise for each of you. You'll no doubt be somewhat shocked at my extraordinary generosity, but... Oh! Andrew! 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 Oh, what's wrong, Andrew? Oh. Andrew! Move back! He's dead. Oh, God! I suppose we should call the police. That won't be necessary. We're already here. You're all under house arrest. We won't have the result of the autopsy until tomorrow, but the preliminary indication is, of course, poison. I was hoping one of you might come forward to save the rest of us a long night in very uncomfortable surroundings. Whoever concocted this diabolical plot, please raise his hand. And the rest of us can go back to the party, right, Lieutenant? Regardless of your feelings for the deceased, I would think you might at least show some sensitivity towards his widow. You could show some sensitivity to our intelligence, Lieutenant starting with what you just happened to be doing here at the precise moment of Andrew's death. Mr. Walker employed me to monitor the guests. He was convinced that someone had been trying to kill him for some time. He felt that tonight presented the perfect opportunity. He gave me this list of what he considered to be the prime suspects. Needless to say, you all appear prominently. Can we possibly save time here? As it was Potter who served up Andrew's poison, is he not a prime murder candidate? Quick, neat and logical, but out of the question. How's that, Lieutenant? As I knew it was Andrew Walker's intention to invite you all upstairs for a toast, I watched Potter carefully. He poured the wine directly from the bottle. I also checked the glasses. As there was nothing in Andrew Walker's glass, the poison must have been dropped in during the few moments that it took Potter to retrieve a silver tray from the serving room. 
Uh, one of you, no doubt, made a slight detour on the way up and slipped something into Andrew's glass. How would we know which glass to put the poison in? Only last week, there was an article in the Sunday Times magazine featuring his wine collection, along with a picture of him holding his favorite and distinctive glass, the one with the gold rim and monogrammed initials. No, no, Dr. Vandenberg, our host's reputation as an urnophile was well documented. He felt you were all equally interested in seeing him dead. So, shall we proceed in order? Mr. Hamilton, you were his business partner, I believe. Well, if you could call it that. When you worked with Andrew, he made it clear from the outset that he was going to do all the taking and that you were going to do all the giving. Oh, you were in the pet food business, I believe. Dog food, originally. Andrew started out in real estate. Did quite nicely as a slum lord. But then, for some reason, decided to get out of the business. Tenants probably wanted to kill him. Andrew looked around for a new opportunity at the same time that my father, who had been ill for some time, was about to be forced into Chapter 11. Andrew bought in and overnight turned the company around. Your father must have been grateful. Grateful? Andrew's first move was to put cardboard shavings in the meat to increase volume and lower the cost of production. My father was horrified, but helpless. By the end of the year, we were back in the black, and my father was dead. I'd say that you had more than enough motivation to kill him. And Dr. Vandenberg, you were Mr. Walker's physician, I believe. The psychiatrist. He was in the peak of health, at least on the outside. And on the inside? The sickest of men. Isn't that a rather subjective judgment for a member of your profession? On the contrary, popular opinion. It doesn't violate the standard patient analyst confidentiality to say that the man was a raving, paranoid schizophrenic. Anyone who had the slightest contact with him knew that. Andrew Walker made Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde look like the Bobsy twins. Well, how long was he under your treatment? Over ten years, without, I might add, showing the slightest sign of improvement. If anything, he got worse. And for that, you wanted to see him dead. I beg your pardon. Isn't it true, Dr. Vandenberg, that Mr. Walker finally left therapy just recently? No. I threw him out for impugning my professional competence. He threatened to tell the other patients that I was inept unless I gave him back his fee over the last ten years. Can you imagine it? He presented me with a bill for $115,000 plus interest. And when you refused to pay it, he went through with his threat. I still can't believe it. He sent out a mailer accusing me of practicing witchcraft and hinting at dark, though never specifically stated, sexual predilections. And so you decided to kill him? No, Lieutenant. The psychiatrist does not become the madman. My patients all stayed with me, including Mr. Walker. I took him back as a professional challenge, but certainly not to murder him. I wish I could say I did it. <laughs> I truly do. Alas, as my limited service record will attest, I am a coward. I get nightmares from watching prison movies, and I don't look good in stripes. You were friends since childhood. Andrew was never a child, just a mean little person on his way to becoming a big, mean person. And then what was the basis of your friendship? Blackmail. How's that? I was very rich and very spoiled. No one would play with me until I met Andrew. Andrew was very cooperative for a price. A baseball here, a popsicle there. Andrew was my best and only, albeit, very expensive friend. Until you ran out of money? Yes. How did that happen? I don't think that's Mr. any Mr. McCartney, business. this is a murder investigation. How did it happen? My mother, unfortunately, took a nasty spill one day on the stock market. Even though you had lent Mr. Walker money his entire life, he turned his back on you when your fortunes were reversed. He slammed the door and padlocked it. I made the dreadful mistake of asking him for 20 bucks to tide me over until my unemployment check came through. He told you to get a job. No. He told me to get two jobs, one during the day and one at night. Andrew said I didn't deserve to survive unless I could weather some hard work. And for that, you vowed someday to kill him. I almost killed him on the spot. But of course, I chickened out. I became a bum for a while, and then finally I was forced to get a job, after which I realized Andrew was indeed right. In fact, I've been quite successful over the past few years, the plant food business. And I owe it all to Andrew's advice and inspiration. I suppose that leaves you, Mrs. Walker. 
What sort of dirt did my dear departed husband dump on me? He was convinced that you were having an affair with one of the men in this room. Well, on that score, he was dead wrong. Oh, forgive the expression. Are you saying that you did not have an affair with one of the men in this room? That's precisely what I'm saying, Lieutenant. For the fact of the matter is, I've had an affair with all three of them. The guests are leaving, madam. Yes, I know. You'll have to excuse me for a few moments. I'm sorry, Mrs. Walker, that's out of the question. Besides, under the circumstances, I think the guests will forgive you for not saying good night. Saying good night, I have to pay them off. You remember the forgotten jewel in the crown of mankind, friendship? Andrew didn't know any of the guests. He had no real friends. Are you saying, Mrs. Walker, that the guests were paid to be here? Technically, no. Andrew merely made the deposit, the remainder of which I'm paying now. He was quite suspicious of shelling out money for work not yet performed. In the world of Andrew Walker, not even a hired friend could fully be trusted. The outfit is called Party People, in case you're ever at a similar loss. They also provide professional mourners, of which no doubt will be in need. Now, shall we resume your interrogation into my amorous wanderings? If you'd rather do this in private. Private? Oh, my God. It's not as if I have anything to hide from anybody in this room. We could lock ourselves in the bathroom, cover our ears. Or we could simply pretend we didn't know about each other. Uh, were the affairs overlapping? I'm a woman of some passion, Lieutenant, not a circus performer. I truly believe now, as I always have, in one man at a time. One woman as well. I beg your pardon? Don't get overheated, Lieutenant. I simply meant that I believe in serial relationships for men as well as women. I found out early in my marriage that my husband didn't share my beliefs. And how early was that, Mrs. Walker? During the honeymoon. Up to that point, I was under the impression that Andrew was not fond of animals. I discovered that the exception was beach bunnies. And so you began to have affairs. Affair. Sorry, you began to have an affair with Mr. McCarthy, I believe. I don't recall the precise order. No, I was first. I take exception to that. You're both wrong. Not that it matters. Unless you're writing your autobiography. The critical point is why you sought such relationships. When I discovered the true nature of my marriage, I wanted out. He threatened to go public with your past. My past? Your participation in certain movies of, shall we say, a dubious nature. <gasps> Is that what he told you? The poor deceived husband who discovers he's married the princess of porn. The duchess of desire was the phrase he used. The closest I've gotten to recording my flesh for posterity was a Polaroid that Andrew took once when I was topless. On your honeymoon, no doubt. Actually, it was earlier this evening as I was stepping out of the shower. I assumed that Andrew wanted to make copies for party favors. Mrs. Walker, if what you're saying about your marriage is true, why did you stay with him all these years? Andrew threatened to kill himself if I left. I didn't think he'd do it, but then I didn't know for sure. You didn't think you could live with the thought that you'd driven a man to kill himself? Not at all, Lieutenant. I simply had too much pride to let him get the best of me. I wasn't about to go through the rest of my life with him laughing from the grave. But if he died, you stood to gain a lot of money. His personal estate is worth more than $30 million, all of which you stood to inherit in the event of his death. Though perhaps you didn't know that. I think we've already heard enough testimony to my husband's paranoia. His will was no exception, however. Long ago, he inserted a codicil to the effect that in the event of his murder, I was to get nothing. It was all to go to the twins. The twins? <laughs> he didn't tell me you had children? He didn't. I was pregnant the first year we were married, but I had a miscarriage. Soon after that, Andrew had a vasectomy. He had an unnatural fear that a male child might replace him. Then who are the twins? Rats, Lieutenant. Rats? Someone sent a pair through the mail. Undoubtedly an act of malice. Not about to let anybody get the upper hand, even anonymously. Andrew had a large cage built for them at the foot of our bed. It was no doubt comforting for him to have members of his own species so close at hand. The plain fact is, Lieutenant, we all had reason to murder Andrew. We all wanted to, individually and in concert. But we didn't. For that act of moral cowardice, we will all someday pay. But not tonight, Lieutenant. I think we've put up with all of this long enough. 
Either arrest one of us or all of us, if you think you can do so without making a fool of yourself, or let us salvage the rest of the evening by going home and getting a good night's sleep. Good night, Lieutenant. I hope you catch Andrew's murder. Let us know. We'd all like to thank him. I trust we won't be stopped by your man at the door. They've all gone. If you'll excuse me, Lieutenant. It's been a rather long evening. My God, you should have seen the expression on your face. It was priceless. Thought you'd finally seen the last of me, and then out of the blue, or rather, out of the bathroom, I'm back for another 40 years of marital bliss. I knew you were sick, but I didn't think even you would stoop this low. Oh, I had intended to stoop much lower. Originally, I was going to impale myself on a butcher's knife and cover you all with pig guts, but Kavanaugh balked. Lieutenant Kavanaugh? Lieutenant. He's an actor and a second-rate one at that. Like your lovers, sweetheart. Like you. That's right, darling. Have a good cry and let it all out. And while you're doing that, I'm going to open that bottle of my girl and drink a toast to the one person I can truly call a friend. Myself. This wasn't a practical joke, was it? You really did think that one of us was trying to kill you. It's an obsession inside of you, growing like a tumor. You couldn't live with it anymore, could you? You had to find out once and for all who it was. You're out of your mind. I am not. This whole charade was meant to produce a suspect. The one who's been stalking you slowly all these years. The one who will someday plunge in the knife Pull the trigger. Poison your precious 48, Marco. Nonsense. No, Andrew, the truth. Your whole little scheme backfired. The joke is on you. Don't you wish that I have wished, Andrew, these many long and torturous years for you to die. But I don't have to wish anymore, because tonight my wish comes true. You couldn't kill me. That's my ace in the hole. You know the will. You'd become penniless overnight. True. Unless, of course, you weren't murdered. What do you mean? Suicide, Andrew, that's what I mean. You see, I knew all about your little plot tonight. So I had my own fake bottle made up. <laughs> How could you possibly have known? Lonely for some real companionship. And to find a life for myself, I decided to take up a hobby. So I enrolled in an acting class where I met a rather second-rate actor who turned out to be a truly first-class man. You'll never get away with this. Anyone who really knows me knows I'd never kill myself. Then again, anyone who really knows you would like to see you dead. If they didn't, they certainly do after tonight. When the real police arrive, we're going to tell them about your little practical joke. The rest will make up, won't we? As soon as all the guests had left, Adelaide confronted you. She asked you how it felt not to have a friend in the world. I said to you that after what you'd done to me and the others, it was the straw that broke the camel's back, and that indeed, finally, I was at last leaving you. And she packed her bags and left. Spent the night in a motel. We know a charming little motel in the country, don't we, darling? And she returned the next day to find you dead, poisoned by your own hand. You see, Andrew, you'd finally made a critical realization, albeit too late, that life really wasn't worth living without friends. Darling, let's leave right now. We'll be leaving soon enough. As soon as I've called the police. What are you talking about? You're going to prison, darling, for an extended stay. Caught red-handed trying to murder your dear husband. I don't Explain it to her, Kavanaugh, after you've arrested her. I really am a police lieutenant. Originally hired off duty, of course, to watch over you at your acting class. You knowingly let an employee sleep with me? Well, it's not as if I had much choice. I had, after all, run out of friends. I'd better get on with this. No, no, there's plenty of time. I want to thank you for all you've done. Why don't you join me in a toast? To a perfect plan. I'd better call the precinct. It's too late, I'm afraid, for both of you. I think you should know before you die that your little plot was about as subtle as an elephant in heat. Uh, 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 
You may be able to explain me. Not suicide, but you'll never get away with Kavanaugh's murder. Oh, but I will. When you discovered that we were having an affair, you decided to take your rival down with you. Fitting revenge, very much in the Walker style. To which your friends, no doubt, testify. But how did you manage the poison? The, the wine was kept in my private cellar. Only one man had the key. Potter brought in two bottles. This is the poisoned one. He switched them after he poured your drinks. I think that despite the fact that the world must remain ignorant of tonight's proceedings, that it's only fitting that before you draw your last breath, that you experience a moment of truth. Tell them, Potter, darling. The butler really did do it. Uh, uh, uh.